guest now is the director of the South Central Telehealth Resource Center, uh, Sarah Rhodes, and we're going to have some conversation, talk a little bit about the, the Telehealth Resource Center. So, thank you for taking your time today. So, yes, tell well, us a little bit. Thank you. Well, appreciate it. So, tell me how you got started with the resource centers, how long you've been the director, and a little bit about the South Central. The South Central Telehealth Resource Center began in 2010, and uh, we originated out of Arkansas, and so we cover the states of Arkansas, Mississippi, and Tennessee, and we're one of 14 telehealth resource centers. There's 12 regional centers and two national centers, and I think the first funded telehealth resource center was in um, 2007. Oh, so really? we, we were in the second wave of funding with the uh, telehealth You know what, resources. as a lot of the readers say with my regional news section, you know, mm -hmm. a lot of people say this is like, the resource centers are like the best kept secret in telehealth, right? That's right, that's right. <laughs> you know, uh, because the, each of them have their own little niche and they really uh, kind of really push the adoption of telehealth in the region. So talk about your region, some of the things that you're working on right now as a resource center uh, and some of the challenges that you see. Well, I will say one of the things that we sort of pride ourselves in the South Central Telehealth region is our videos. And so we really go out and we talk to patients and providers. And so we get their story because we really feel like the story of telemedicine is going to propel that. So we want to talk to the patient who's had a stroke or who's had, a, had an issue or a problem. And uh, telehealth helps them with their health care. And you, you may agree that we need more of those stories, right? Yes, that's right. We need right. more of those stories about the the success. I think we show that, and we really show more of that. Um, so that that's kind of a, you know, it's important that we do share those stories. Mm -hmm. Where can you find those? That's learntelehealth.org, correct? Learntelehealth.org, and we're actually in the process of uh, developing a documentary, and we're going to call it Underserved. <laughs> yes, Underserved is going to be the the name of our documentary, and so we have uh, wonderful stories from. Uh, from patients and also providers. Mm -hmm. So give me one of those stories then. Or you want to save it for the documentary, but give me okay. one of those stories. I will give you one. One of our uh, excellent telehealth champions is uh, a reverend who is uh, who was preaching. And so he tells his story of how he had a stroke while he was preaching. And then the congregation took him to the closest hospital and he received care by telemedicine. And now he has no disability. So because of and telemedicine. You know, and, and it's a tell, and, and one of those things with, with a stroke is when seconds count, mm -hmm. you know, the TPA. And, and that's where a lot of these programs have started, right, with telestroke. That's right. Um, and, you know, there's a lot of stories like that mm -hmm. on the stroke program. Um, also, so, you know, with your background, you've done a lot of research, right? You were one of the researchers. So tell me what you did in that role and what you found, right? Because we need to now, now that we're using these technologies and develop these type of programs, we're getting data back. So what did you find from some of the research right. you've done? So um, one of the things that, that providers say, well, what if I have to tell my patient bad news by telemedicine? What, what do patients think about that? And so uh, myself and a team of researchers, we interviewed women who had received bad news during pregnancy by telemedicine, you know, which is a sad story, but, uh, and you think, oh, how do they interact with the physician and the sonographer and the genetics counselor that way? But the ladies that we interviewed and, and we um, heard their stories, they actually preferred being closer to home because they could drive to be with their support network and close to their family five, 15 minutes away. Whereas if they were in the big city and had to drive three to four hours back home, they were all by themselves, you know. So they like being close to their network and their um, social support system. Mm -hmm. So that's what the research is showing a lot of patient right. satisfaction yes. and mm -hmm. really being able to that comfort and not leaving. Right? That's right, right. that's right. Mm -hmm. That's great. So let's talk about the champions, right? We talked a lot about that. We had we spoke with Dr. Uh, Lowry earlier mm -hmm. about the importance of the champion. Um, how do you build those champions? Because you're in charge of building those champions. So you've got to bring the awareness and you've got to groom these people that a lot of people come to you with very minimal telehealth knowledge, right? Just kind of exploring. So you got to really build their knowledge for them and create champions in those communities and those uh, those programs. So what are the first roadblocks, what concrete steps to becoming a champion that you would say? Uh, I think um, uh, finding that person who has a passion. So whether it's a healthcare provider or a community uh, person in, in your community, uh, the mayor could even be a telehealth champion. Someone that really wants to promote healthcare in their area. and. Um, uh, latch on to them and educate them and tell them ways that, that you can um, help facilitate care um, or 
for the ways that they can facilitate or provide care mm -hmm. to, to patients. You know, a lot of people say, like, if they don't want to do it, don't force them to do it. That's Find right. the people that are passionate about it, and it, it kind of spreads. Mm -hmm. And also what's important, uh, you know, maybe you can comment on this as well, is that continued kind of, uh, not only uh, champion building, but uh, engagement, right? Like, you, you know, we talked about it in the, the business development track earlier with uh, Elizabeth from uh, Phoenix, which was, listen, we don't just do the focus groups and the engagement in the beginning, throughout the longevity of the program. So what are some tips of just keeping the program fresh, engaged, and also updated on all the new regulatory stuff, right? Because things are changing all, every day. So That's what are right. some steps in that? And uh, communication is a big thing. Education, we have um, multiple teleconferences where we connect with providers in mm -hmm. their area. We, uh, like for example, when Ebola was um, a big clinical topic a few years ago, we held educational conferences and reached 88% of the hospitals and uh, facilities in Arkansas. So it's a good way to get information out in a, in a very quick way. Um, also building those relationships, yeah. as you said. So um, the people in these hospitals know me by name. They there know Dr. Bellara by name. They know our cell phone numbers. They can call us and, and, uh, and you know, we can uh, communicate by phone as well as interactive video. That's one of the great things about these telehealth programs, right, is you're creating really connected, like you say, connected care, because we're optimizing all the resources that are available. So building that in the beginning of the program is, is very, very And exciting. I will say um, a lot of people would think, oh, it's the younger yeah, folks that too. latch on the technology, yeah. but we have this, uh, this lady, and I won't say, uh, how old she is, but uh, <laughs> you can definitely tell her that she's in the mm -hmm. older end of the age spectrum, and she's one of our biggest telehealth champions. She's on wow. every educational event, and she's right. from small town Arkansas, and uh, she's just a wonderful uh, resource for the people in her facility. She's the one that that uh, connects people in the facility and brings them in to listen. Okay, let's, let's just build up on that, because you say you talk to a lot of patients, and you're really getting some patient data and some satisfaction. Mm -hmm. You know, there's a big stigma that, and listen, I'm from Florida, so we, we, we talk to seniors. Seniors will never get it. This is not going to work for them. They're not good with technology. What I've seen from my experience is, listen, they say, hey, give us enough credit. Give us more credit. We want these. We have better use of, you know, better uh, way of life with these technologies. So give me some, give, give me some thoughts on your experience in talking to seniors about using these technologies, whether it's from a monitoring or some of these devices. I agree. I think um, seniors are... Uh, uh, the next way to adopt healthcare, especially with remote patient monitoring, mm -hmm. taking their blood pressure. Uh, how many grandparents do you know that are on Facebook looking at yeah, their grandkids exactly. <laughs> and, and uh, you know commenting on yeah, their grandkids' yeah. uh, activities, and uh, or using FaceTime yeah. to to chat with their their children and things. So I think definitely it's not an age barrier associated Correct. with it. We just need to make sure that the technology we use uh, uh -huh. is appropriate and easy. And it makes it easy. It doesn't exactly matter like if it's uh, one age of the age, age spectrum versus mm -hmm. the other. If it's Correct. easy to use, easy to adopt, uh, people will use it. And that's one of the drivers, right? When you look at the drivers of telehealth, you're looking at physician shortages, you're looking at one of the biggest things is aging populations, right? So we're going towards that. All these are main drivers, and that's why the use of telehealth is rising, right? So um, that's great. So I mean, give me some numbers. Let's end with that. Let me. Well, actually, let's end with this. Like, what you know? What are some future things that you're working on that you want to see? Not only in telehealth realm, <clears throat> but in in regards to the resource centers. I think um, for sure the telehealth resource centers are there for for you. So depending where you are, uh, you can always go to our website, which mm -hmm. is uh, telehealthresourcecenters.org, yeah. or we have a specific website with um, the South Central, it's learntelehealth.org. Right. And so you can visit any one of those sites and we'll connect you with the people in, in your city or your yes, town. And um, the nice thing about the telehealth resource centers um, I know Arkansas, I know Tennessee, and I know Mississippi, and I, I can connect you with people there um, to help you in the same way if you're in Montana, New York, or Alaska. We right. know people that can connect you there. And if you have a question that I don't know, I can Tell ask my wide network of friends with the other telehealth resource centers and probably have an answer to you within 24 hours. Yeah, and the resource centers do cover uh, each and every state so you know you can get an answer wherever whatever state you're in so we appreciate that we appreciate the value of the, the telehealth resources and everything you're doing here with south central and holding the office in this awesome conference so thank you guys uh for for joining us and uh, have a great one thanks thank guys. you